1. The same day when went Jesus out of the house, and he sat by the seaside. Verse 2, And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. This has been found for what it's worth in later years, this particular spot. And, and when you're in a little ship pulled off away from the shore, it provides a natural amphitheater whereby m multitudes could hear him speak because it makes a natural amphitheater and uh, how precious it is to, to hear his voice. Verse 3, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. This chapter 13 in this great book of Matthew is one of the most important chapters in God's Word that you should understand. If you want His blessings, if you want to be pleasing to Him, if you want to understand His Word. The first thing to understand is to understand the sower. What we're talking about here is broadcasting. This is, broadcasting is what the way you plant, we would even to this day, small um, seed such as, let's say, clover um, for a small place, patch, or, um, or turnips or something of that nature that you can sow with broadcast. A man, a grown, an adult man can usually you have a bag with the seed in it, usually around your neck or on a hip, and you can take a handful of seed and you can sow about 30 feet in either direction, which is quite a swath, as we would call it, okay, in sowing seed, and that's broadcasting. Now, coming out the gate, get it straight in your mind, the seed is the Word of God. And you can see, in a sense, the analogy that right now we're broadcasting. We're broadcasting to the world. That's quite a swath. But the word will go out. That is the seed. And that word will fall on many places. Christ explains now how those places um, uh, adhere and do the will of God. So there you have the broadcast sower. That's what he's doing. Verse 4 to continue. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. The wayside was the path, okay? It was a beaten path like you would have a sidewalk today or even a street. In sandals and footprints, they pack that soil down, the, the, the terra firma. They pack it down until no seed could take root through that, okay? And, and naturally, is not going to take root, and when you're broadcasting, the, you cannot control where each little seed goes. So some of it's going to fall in the wrong place. Any more than in teaching God's Word, the true seed, um, you cannot expect 100% germination of the truth sprouting forth. Uh, verse 5, some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith, they sprung up. I mean, they, they sprouted and came right on up because they had no depthness of earth, deepness of earth. They, they couldn't have a root system, and a plant must have a root system to grow. Verse 6, And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And, and so it is with some people that hear God's Word. When the sun comes up and men scorch them a little bit for holding the truth, they cast it away. Don't want any part of that. Seven. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Now, the thorn bramble bush is usually um, um, an analogy towards Satan. Okay. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, um, the trees and vines at one time would want to fix themselves a king. And nobody wanted to be that king. And finally the bramble bush, thorn bush, said, hey, uh, you got your man. 
I'll be your king. But if I'm going to be your king, you've got to come and worship under my shadow. And you see, there's just one problem. The bramble bush or thorn bush doesn't make a shadow. Therefore, it's deception coming out the gate. So <clears throat> uh, there you've got it. No shadow, no uh, depth, eight. And another fell into a good ground and brought forth fruit, some in hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. You know, it doesn't matter. That's good soil. And God expects the, the harvest to be whatever the gift is he gives man or woman or child. And from a, a one he gives much, he expects much. So, but um, the reward is still the same for the hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold. It's completeness. It's what God expects of that individual. And, uh, and so it is that that crop would produce. Verse 9, listen carefully. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And, and this means if you can understand the truth, and if you have ears to hear the word of God, then certainly he expects you to understand the simplicity by utilizing the analogy which he has put forth of the sower and seed being the word of God that you could understand people's minds also as to how uh, word is received. Now, uh, naturally, coming out the gate, let me say, never think that you're going to have 100% hear your word when you're sowing the seed, the word of God. They're not going to. Um, and God has reasons for it. We'll see if we can get into it. Verse 10. And the disciples came, and they said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Now, why don't you just lay it out there like it is? Verse 11. And he answered, and he said unto them, Because... Here's your answer. Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. In other words, it is important that you absorb that. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven are given to those that will be a doer, that will receive the blessings of God, that will act upon it. And, and will plant seeds, will be a sower of that seed. Verse 12, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. In other words, if if, you, if God gives you a truth and you don't share it, he's not going to give you anything else. So when, when, when he gives you a seed to plant, plant it. That doesn't mean you've got to get out on a street corner and preach or anything. If God gives you a truth, sooner or later somebody's going to ask you a question and you should share it. And then God will give you more. But uh, if you hide it under a bushel, your light, you're not going to produce anything. It is God's time and God's place. And I, I want you to know that one little seed is as important to our Heavenly Father as the, the whole load. So when you plant one little seed, it can be very important. Don't ever sell yourself short. If you convert or, or pass one truth alone, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. That's the way God's mystery works. Verse 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. They, they cannot understand anything spiritual. A and so it is. You know, in the fourth chapter of, I believe it is Mark, God said, you either understand this parable of the sower or you won't understand any of my parables. And that's really kind of true of how it is because the tares will be coming along in a moment. That's part of the sowing. 
And if you don't understand that part, really you are hard pressed to understand any parable because this particular chapter, as I said, becomes very important because it gives you the overall view. It identifies your opposition, which puts you on guard. But many people say you can see, you can see um, um, the sun come up every morning, you can see it go down at night, you can see the stars at night, but you don't see God's truth. And hearing, you can hear all kinds of things, but someone could teach God's word directly into your ear and it would, go, it would be soundless because you wouldn't understand it. That's what he's saying. And uh, God would say, there are some I don't want to understand at this time. It's to protect them probably against committing the unpardonable sin. Verse 14, and in them, is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, that's to say Isaiah, which saith, by hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. And of course he's talking about um, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9. And so it is that in Isaiah 6, 9, you would, you would have the, the lesson on what brought this forth and, and it would make a nice home study for you on your own. You can start about verse eight if you want. Who wants, to, who can I send? Who will hear? You will, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Verse 15, for this people's heart is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed. That's to say they're spiritual eyes. Many times you have to close your physical eyes to open your spiritual eyes to communicate with Almighty God, to be able to see the spiritual. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart, that's their mind, and should be converted and I should heal them. And, um, and, and you know, Hebrews chapter five, verse 11, makes it very clear. He says, you, you, you're not even ready to come out of the milk, some of you. So I can't teach you the truth because you don't have ears to hear or eyes to see. And, and uh, so it is. Uh, makes a good side study for you to think about. Uh, you have to get into the depth of God's word and it isn't deep, it's simple. It's common sense in knowing and understanding his word. And again, He's not going to convert somebody to come into the election or even the free will part that will witness when they would deny the Holy Spirit and it could do much harm. That's why he has the millennium, is to teach those that are just incapable of hearing or doing in the flesh. Uh, that, a lot of people may, be re, may resent that statement. It's a fact, verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, God's elect, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. 17, for verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those sights, things, which you see, and have not seen them, and you might, that trans, you'll notice that them is in italics. You can translate that him, seeing him, which is to say Christ. Um, and to hear those things or to hear him, Christ, which you hear and have not heard him instead of them. And, and so it is. Many of the prophets, they wanted to live in your generation when all this was going down how fortunate you are to live in this generation whereby you see the parable of the fig tree as it comes forth and you see God's word unfolding before you and you know that the false one is coming soon and you must make that stand. That's why some, as it is written in Romans 11, why they're not going to see, they're, they have the spirit of stupor or slumber upon them. Basically, for God's love, their own protection. Verse 18, 
Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. I'm going to explain it to you. Verse 19. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, that's the seed, is the word of the king, that's the king and his dominion, that's Christ and all the universe and the world, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth the way that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. I mean, the wicked one, what? It's ways of the world and Satan. The controversy is between Satan and Almighty God. They, they can't handle the word, so they're deceived by the wicked one. When, when it says that um, um, he uh, takes them away, he catches the way that one which is uh, sown, um, he catches them away with what? Well, he's going to promise them he's going to fly them away. And many of them are going to believe it because they don't know in as much as they haven't studied the sixth, the, the book of Revelation to know that at the sixth trump, the Antichrist comes. The true Christ doesn't come until the seventh. So they're harvested out of season. And he does catch them away right real quick. Christ is returning here to set up a kingdom, not to catch somebody away. Verse 20. But he that received the seed in, into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and a noun. A noun means immediately, with joy, receiveth it. I've got it. I've got the truth. I see it. I know it. But remember, it's, it's in a stony place. It can't take root. And there it sits. But you, you saw, you have observed people like that where you planted seeds of the truth and they were so excited. They had it right down, I mean, to the wire. Then what happens? Verse 21. Yet hath he not root in himself. There's no depth. But dureth, dureth, but dureth for a while. He endures for a little bit. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, because of what? Because of the word, his belief, by and by, that's the same word as a noun, it means instantly, he is offended. He'll drop it. Boy, can't stand that pressure. Why? Well, because he has no depth. He does not, I mean, what we're dealing with is eternal life. You know, this flesh age is just for a little while. But believing in our Heavenly Father is forever, both in the earth age in the beginning and that that comes. The whole, I mean, the whole thing evolves within that because those that will not listen and adhere, you're not going to be there. This is going to cull you right out if you're not really true and, and you let the least little bit of tribulation of the world shake you, then you're not fit to serve the living God. There is the millennium. Praise God for that. Verse 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world, this world age is what it says, and the uh, deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. I mean, it just, um, there is no way that trying to make it in this world, it comes first and he puts put the truth on the back burner. And it's one of the, you become unfruitful. Why? Because God's not going to bless you. You're not going to be successful in anything, not even in the ways of this world. You know, people that make it without God's blessings. There's nothing wrong with being rich with God's blessings. Okay. As a matter of fact, God promises it, that uh, uh, in, in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, that the church of Smyrna, you are rich, rich in truth, and even with the blessings of God and in, in the world. Well, when God blesses you, you can't go wrong. So therefore, um, never apologize for wealth gained righteously from Almighty God. But um, trying to make it 
the hard way, you're always going to look over your shoulder and wonder when are they going to catch you. They will. Okay, it's short-lived in that respect. So, don't sow among the thorns, which is to say, in a patch in this world, where you're more concerned about what people might say, or the deceitful uh, teachings of other people, and so forth, to let deception, which is Babel, draw you away from the true word of God the true planting of God. Don't let that happen to you. Verse 23, But he that received seed unto the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. They, they, it all pays the same thing in God's eyes because uh, whatever God gives you, that he expects in return. And when, for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear, the truth of God's word is so very wonderful. To, to you know, his method of teaching in this way that you have this laid out right in front of you of what to do with God's Word, how to, how to sow it. Don't expect 100% of every seed to, to fall on ears that are going to hear. It's not. But that one part that does makes it all worthwhile. That's the sowing the Master's Word, that that Word can change lives, can give hope, can bring happiness, and completeness. You see, knowing your destiny from the sower, the fact that you are loved of God, and from the teaching of the close of the last chapter, your family, you're his family, and he loves you. And when you return that love, he's going to bless you, and he's going to help open your mind even more to his truth, whereby you can let your light shine brighter and plant more seeds with success, and how precious it is. And he would use this simple way of a man sowing seed, or a woman, to show you the very truth of God's Word and what's going to happen to it when you sow it. He continues then in the next verse, in verse 24, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto, to, unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. And this is, this is put, taking this whole earth age now and, and uh, laying it out where you can understand it. It's, this is the parable. And it is a parable. It is the world, and a man sows good seed. Every one of them was a good seed. Verse 25, But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now, who is this enemy, and what are tares? Uh, tares are, in actuality, are they would be called zawan. And when it's growing, take the wheat plant, the zawan looks exactly while they're growing as wheat. And you can't, you can hardly tell the difference. So if you were to go in there to hoe out or plow out the zawan, you're going to wreck a lot of wheat while you're at it because you can't tell the difference. So you have to let them grow. And, and when they come to maturity, the wheat, you have this rich golden grain that God uh, made from which comes bread and other things. But what comes from the zawan, the one that the wicked one planted while others slept? That means while they were blindsided, deceived, these evil seeds were planted the zawan brings forth a black, bitter, poisonous grain. And it is poison. And so is false teaching. 
And naturally what this is leading up to is the fact that the man who sowed the good seed was Almighty God through the Son. The wicked seed was sown by Satan himself. That's what this parable will be leading up to. This is why I told you this is one of the most important parables and not everybody will be able to see it. They'll say, are you saying that the serpent sowed seed in this earth? Well, of course he did. God declares it. In, in um, Genesis, uh, the great book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, he says to the serpent, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. So naturally, then, oh, dear goodness, I, my preacher said never talk even about the serpent seed. Well, you'd better. That's what the parable is about. And if you're not blind, you'll be able to see it. So here, the word seed from here on becomes children. Okay. It's a little different word in the Greek language. And it means children. So that you don't have any problems understanding it. And, and so it is. W what has happened so forth? Well, here's the world. This probably is, is a, one of the most important chapters in Father's Word. It helps you uh, to understand the plan of God, basically, the foundation of it. As a matter of fact, in Mark chapter 4, uh, Christ there says, if you don't understand this parable of the sower and the tares, you're not going to understand any of the parables. There is, it would be impossible for you to have the whole package wrapped up of God's plan without understanding this chapter. Now, we're into the subject of um, the earth, the planting, and it says that um, the, um, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man who sowed good seed, and an enemy came and sowed bad seed. And the word seed here changes, it's a little different in the Greek, it's sperma. So you know you're talking about children, all right? And, um, and of course, we know from uh, horticulture that the tares are zawan. And zawan, when it grows, it looks exactly like wheat. But when they both produce grain, one is golden and we use it for food. And the other, the tares, the one, it's black and it's poison. Uh, and um, what a difference. But while they're growing, you can't tell the difference. And that's what God wants you to know. It's real difficult sometimes to tell the difference. All, all children are his. And if anything, it's our job to convert them, not destroy them. Uh, at this time yet, okay? So, but uh, the point being made, you can't, while you're here on earth and until the very end when the fruit is produced, you can't tell the difference, basically. You can spiritually, though, all right? Good clue for you. All right, let's go with the next verse we were coming to. Verse 26, uh, word of wisdom from our Father, and verse 26 concerning the tares reads, But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. I mean, boy, you could tell the difference then. Verse 27, so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? What, what is this poison doing in here? And, and again, I want to re reiterate the word seed here is sperma, meaning children. Verse 28, he said unto them, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou that we go and gather them up? Verse 29, But he said, Nay, no way. Lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Meaning, you really can't tell the difference until they produce fruit. This is why you have to buy their fruit, you shall know them. This is why you are taught to test the fruit. Verse 30, let both, this is his instructions, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. 
but gather the wheat into my barn. Remember back in chapter 3, verse 12, what it said there? I'm going to go back there real quick. If, and um, verse, chapter 3, verse 12, and chapter 3, verse 12 reads, concerning Christ, whose fan is in his hand, that's a threshing fan, winnowing fan, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, that's the thrashing floor, and gather his wheat into the garner, that's his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire, uh, a consuming fire. God is a consuming fire. <clears throat> so he's able to handle it. He's able to take care of it. So there you have the parable of the tares. Then who, who is this wicked seed? And naturally, you know, as a servant of God, it's Kenites, which is to say the sons of Cain. <clears throat> Verse 31, another parable, listen carefully. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven, that's the king in his dominion of, in heaven, is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Smallest seed among the herbs, okay? Well, and this says it, verse 32, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is greatest among the herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. And naturally, the mustard seed, as you sow it, anytime you sow a, a mustard is good. And, but uh, so that you get a better picture in this part, in, in the Middle East mm -hmm. and near Jerusalem, mustard grew to where it would be up to a man on a horseback. Okay? So it did grow actually up into a tree there, basically. Not a huge tree, but among, a tree for an herb. But what, what is the meaning then? If you start a work for God, though it's good, then before it is done and before it is over, you will have the false ones, actually the tares, come and they'll roost in it. They'll try to destroy it. So you have to be on guard in a good church for Satan will send his little emissaries and they will roost in try to roost in the branches of the house of God, not to help it, but to entangle it and to destroy it if it was possible. It's not possible. Not if you have true people of God heading it. So uh, there you have it. Verse 33, let's go with another parable. He's giving, and if you don't understand these, again, you won't understand any of God's uh, parables. And other parables spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now, sometimes um, naturally uh, leaven is usually equated as sin, so you have to take this in the negative sense. So we, we'll use it in the negative sense. You can have your whole church design but if you let a little leaven into it, it'll permeate through the whole congregation. So you can't allow that. It just can't happen. Now, if we were to take this in the good sense, uh, which is not correct, but we're going to do it anyway, uh, because if you take a group that is kind of misled and let a little truth into the, into the congregation that will begin to spread the real truth, and it will also spread. This should not be taught, though, in that positive sense, though it is a fact, because leaven is always related to sin in the negative sense. And so be it. Verse 34. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. They, you would have to understand the meaning before it would have any uh, would increase your knowledge. Okay, Verse 35, why? Here's the answer. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. 
I will utter things that have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. They're quoted from Psalm 78. Okay. Um, there, there is an interesting thing here, and you need, to, you need to study God's Word in more depth. What does it mean it was hidden in secret from the foundation? What, what is this word foundation in the manuscripts? It is a word that you hear me use many times, and I, I want you, I'm not going to show it to you on the character generator because I want you to look it up yourself in your Strong's Concordance. It is the word 2602, 2602, and its prime is 2598, which means what? Uh, 2602 is katabo, the, old, the, the, uh, the falling, and from the prime, it's the overthrow. In other words, it was the overthrowing of Satan himself. This has been kept secret since then of what Satan would do, the wicked seed that would be planted and so forth. But you need to get yourself in gear and check that out for yourself so that you see it with your own eyes and lock it into your own mind. I'll give you the word again. It's the word foundation, of course, in the English. But in the Greek manuscripts, you will find it as 2602. And coming from the prime 2598, and it means the overthrow in the first earth age. Um, not just a little overthrow, the whole thing. So what is the secret then? Well, you pretty well already had it with the parables but let's see how the disciples take this. 36, then Jesus sent the multitude away. You don't, you don't have the multitude here any longer. And he went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Not even they totally got it, but here we only have his students. So he's not going to be speaking in a parable He's going to be explaining one. It's important that you absorb that. He's not going to be teaching in a parable. He will be explaining a parable. Verse 37, He entered and he said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. In other words, that is God. Son of Man is usually Christ as he walked the earth in the flesh, okay? Yeah, the Holy Spirit with the Son was, was when the creation took place. And of course, um, uh, the seed here being the sperma. So we're talking about children, okay? Verse 38, the field is the world. Oh, well now that, which means world age, okay? The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Well, who would the children of the kingdom be? Well, naturally, it would be God's elect and those that believe on Almighty God. And they are children here, all right? Uh, children of the living God. But the tares, uh-oh, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Well, now, who wonder the wicked one could be? I think most everyone knows, naturally. But inasmuch as he's explaining a parable instead of teaching one, he himself will tell you, verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, this world age, eon. And the reapers are the angels. This is why that you leave them alone, but how, who is this and what could we be speaking of here? Naturally, he's saying <clears throat> the enemy sowed the seed. Well, then we know, uh, who could he be talking about? Well, have you ever read John chapter 8? John chapter 8, uh, verse 42. You're not going to have it, but make a note of it. John chapter 8, verse 42. Did Jesus ever say, this is Christ talking now. Verse 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, this is those that claim to be of our brother Judah, and were indeed lying. If God were your father, you would love me. 
For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Your ears are closed. 44. How sharp are you? You don't have to be very sharp. A child can understand. Verse 44. You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Well, now let's see. Who was the first murderer? Duh. Well, naturally, it was Cain, and his offspring are Kenites. So now we know who the seed is and who sowed it. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. But uh, because there is no truth in him, and when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. In other words, it's Satan's seed. Well, dear goodness, what you mean Satan had seed here on earth? Well, have you ever studied the Bible? Have you ever read uh, Genesis chapter 3? The first uh, prophecy that was given by Almighty God? The first prophecy in the Bible. What does it say? Verse 15 of chapter 3, the great book of Genesis, in the beginning. And I will put, he's speaking to the serpent, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So here we have why, how uh, Satan wholly seduced, as it is written, beguiled Eve. And how that, well, do you mean that the serpent had seed? Well, that's what God said. Now, now let me tell you something. You'll have people that will make light of serpent seed. Then they're, they're not Bible students. They haven't read Genesis. For this is God speaking, our Heavenly Father. And he's making it very clear here that the serpent has children. And we see where they originated from. That, that isn't, um, you know, there, was, there were seven churches in the great book of Revelation. And there was only two out of those seven that um, were approved of by Jesus Christ. Does your church teach what those two churches taught? If it doesn't, you're in a heap of hurt. Um, the Church of Smyrna, in chapter 2, um, I'm going to pick it up with uh, verse 9. I know thy work, speaking of this church, and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know blasphemy of them which say they are of Judah, our brother Judah, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan and the offspring of Satan, the serpent seed. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer, because the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days, and only ten days. And again, when you go on to chapter 3 to the church of Philadelphia, that's the only other church that Christ found approval with. If you're in one of the others, you're in a heap of hurt. But he would say to the church of Philadelphia, those that have the key of David, that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man open. I know thy works, in verse 9, 8 rather. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. This, you can see the seed and understand the beginning and the parables. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name because I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are of our brother Judah, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. <clears throat> Why would they worship at your feet? Because you're at the feet of Christ. It is he that they're worshiping. Why? On the first day of the millennium, every knee, cannot and all, will bow to the living God. It won't stay there. 
but when, when they recognize and realize. Now, these are the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is amazing to me that how few people that claim to be Christians are aware of this. They don't understand that parable. And it is put forth so simply in this 13th chapter uh, from verse 37 to 42 that a child can understand it because Christ lays it out in a way that you couldn't miss. So it becomes important. Well, what does this really do? It identifies your enemy. You know where Satan and who he works through and around when you're familiar with this teaching. And it assists you in teaching truth because overall it is the plan of God. Who will follow God and who will follow Satan? <clears throat> he has his evil spirits and God has his Holy Spirit. Satan has his children, the Kenites, and God has his children, the elect, and, and, and naturally the, he is the father of all. But some have fallen. That's what that catabol, that word foundation translated means, the overthrow. When Satan became so evil, he had to overthrow that first earth age as it is written in uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, um, verse 18 and 19. The overthrow itself spoken of in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 18, 19 and forward. So there you have it. It's so simple to understand. Maybe then you can begin to understand the world a little better and how that these, um, the enemies of God try to, they would still today cry, crucify him then you can recognize why they said it. They were the seed of the enemy, the children of the enemy, and the deeds of their father they will do. Okay, returning into that 13th chapter of Matthew, the next verse up, please, would be verse 40. <clears throat> As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Now, there is nothing wrong that a minister, it'll really check him out if he can convert a terror or not, because they are convertible. You can really feel like you've accomplished something if you can truly convert one, then instead of being a child of the devil, they become a child of the living God. Verse 41, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, that's the Lord Jesus Christ will send forth the angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which are which do iniquity uh, so there you have it who does iniquity those that worship the antichrist that's a sin so you want to be very careful that's why this this particular chapter is so potent and this is why revelation becomes so important that you understand the sixth trump and the seventh especially if you don't understand any of the others, you should know the, the sixth and the seventh. Why? Because the sixth trump is Satan's trump. Six, six, six. Six zeal, six trump, six vial. Christ's trump is the seventh when the true Christ returns and, and is called, what is called the second advent. So how precious it is to follow God's word. Iniquity is those that fall short. And if you do not know and understand what's about to transpire, when we get to the 24th chapter, you're going to wake up and you're going to see a lot going on if you have eyes to see and ears to hear and if you can understand this parable. So let's continue then with to the next verse, 42. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. God is a consuming fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. A lot of people are going to be very disappointed at this time, and, and, uh, and, and, and so it is that uh, uh, they, uh, be, with the deception, it comes real hard that um, that fiery furnace, the lake of fire, it simply is to, to destroy have your time in sequence here so that you know what we're talking about. The lake of fire does not come into being 
until the last day of the millennium. So that is a thousand years after the second advent, that is to say after the true Christ returns to this earth. And there will be a lot of teaching in that time, so don't prejudge anybody. Um, God's elect have a lot of work to do, teaching with Christ as it's written in Revelation 20 verse 5, a thousand years with Christ as priest, teaching, helping, trying to drag people back away from the, the, the abyss and with the beautiful truth of loving our Heavenly Father, which is really what He requests and what He desires. So how, how blessed it is. Verse 43 to continue. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, um, it's important that you know also how what good our Father is. Everything that offends and everything that brings hurt to our people is done away with at that time. That's why they can shine and come forth with the beauty of our Heavenly Father, knowing He's in charge, He's in control. And certainly um, we have nothing to be concerned about because there won't be anything left there that does offend after that time. That's why it's so precious that you want to inherit eternal life and be a citizen of that kingdom whereby you can shine forth as the sun in happiness, in joy, and in completeness. Verse 44, we're going to have about another parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field the which when a man hath found, he hideth and for, uh, for joy thereof, he goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. What he's telling you is in the meaning of that peril, parable, that, that, um, that treasure in the field, the field is the world, and that treasure is the truth. The truth of knowing who the seed of the serpent are, the, the, who they are, to know who your enemies are, to know that you will not be deceived when the false one appears on this earth claiming to be Christ. That false teaching will not draw you into some flyaway doctrine which God is against, as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 20 through 25 but that you have work to do for our Heavenly Father, and you'll learn what that work is when we get to the 24th chapter. But um, you would give all for that truth. Why? Because that truth is the wealthiest thing you'll ever own because it brings the blessings of God on you and your family, whereby you can prosper in all things if you truly believe and work at it. The treasure's worth it. Then verse 45, how about another one? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. In other words, that's his business. He's an expert. He's in that business. He knows what a pearl is when he sees it. He knows what the best pearl is when he sees it. That's what, that's what uh, this is like, verse 46. Who, when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. In other words, it was worth everything he had. You don't have to sell everything you have. God paid the price it's free to you to receive that truth from God, and yet it is as precious as that one pearl. If you gave everything for it, you would gain everything, heaven, the world, and all, because you had that precious pearl of great price, the truth from God's Word. Knowing who your enemies are, knowing what you must do not to offend, you don't bother them, you leave them alone. You can't tell the difference, basically, other than if God gifts you spiritually, that you have spiritual discernment, then you can tell, certainly, and know. But um, it's just precious the way our Father speaks to us and lets us know how precious the truth is, and truly it is. Well, how could it be? Because it gives you eternal life. I know many people think they have eternal life. 
but they are told they don't even have to study the book of Revelations or even God's Word, basically, that they're going to be gone when the end happens. And unfortunately, that's not true because that's Satan's message when he comes at the sixth trump saying, I've come to fly you out of here. And you don't want to go there. You want to stand against him. The only two churches in the book of Revelation that Christ was happy with stood against them. Let's go with another one. Next verse, 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, good, bad, and the ugly, all in one bundle. Verse 48, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, into God's house, but cast the bad away. In other words, it's a time of separation. And, and socially, uh, you separate yourself from their beliefs and bring yourself into the belief of Almighty God. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying and, and become isolated that you don't go to a sinner to help them. That's, that's not what it's saying. But it's saying that when God returns and those that have loved Him, fish is always a fish is symbolic of Christianity. The, the cipher is Christ himself as Savior of the children. And the good are going to be put in God's house and the others are going to be cast away. They're, they're gone. That's why that this parable is, these parables are priceless because they gain you if you believe and follow and accept, they gain you eternal life with the Heavenly Father. It doesn't get any better than that. That's why it is so precious. Next verse, please, verse uh, 49. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. It's, there's a separation coming, and that separation is a good thing. If they've had every opportunity, and the end does not come until the, the end of the millennium. Verse 50 and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, that's the wicked, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, and there certainly will be. Do you know why? Because a lot of them will believe that they were serving Christ. They're going to come to him at, when he returns and say, oh, Jesus, we're so glad to see you. We've cast out demons in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Why? Because they worship the long, wrong Jesus. They don't, they're not even taught that the false Messiah comes first. And they are so, they're easy prey for the wicked one. Yep, there's two different seeds. You want to be careful. Christ made it very plain. This is not the teachings of a man. This is the teachings of Almighty God delivered by the Word that became flesh and walked among us. chapters in God's Word letting you know a set of parables. And what, what was the subject of those parables? What's the kingdom of heaven like? What does it take to get there? Who is your enemy? And how do you handle him? It's all given there, but it's given in parables. Some have eyes to see and some don't. Some have ears to hear, some don't. But when you, as a matter of fact, it's said in the fourth chapter of Mark, if you don't understand this set of parables, you won't understand any of them to the depth that they go. This particular parable took us all the way, this set of parables took us all the way back into the first earth age, whereby it would read in verse 35, these things were kept secret from the foundation of the world, meaning the catabol, the overthrow when Satan rebelled. And when Satan rebelled, he was the same one that planted the wicked seed in the garden, which is this earth. And um, therefore, we have the Kenites. Out of Christ's own mouth, in the uh, 38th verse and the 39th verse, he lets you know who planted that wicked seed. We still have them with us. That's your enemy. That is where the enemy, I should say, rests. And sometimes man can be his own worst enemy if he doesn't adhere to God's Word. 
So that's all up to you. God gave each of us the choice and the free uh, of either free will, or if you be one of God's elect, uh, no more need be said about it. You have a destiny. So with that having been said, chapter 13, verse 51, let's pick it up there, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, Jesus said unto them, Have you understood all these things? Are your eyes open? Are your ears open? Can you hear? Can you see? Verse, uh, they say unto him, Yea, Lord, yes, we, we've got it. We understand. And, uh, and that's as it should be with God's elect. Why? Because they're the ones that bring it forward and teach it. Verse 52, Then said he unto them, Therefore, Every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven, and that's what those, all that group of uh, parables is about, the kingdom of heaven, is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasures things new and things old. In other words, the old is the fact that these were hidden bef uh, before in the, the first earth age. Some of them were, and it brings you on out uh, both the Old and the New, the Old Testament, the New Testament, but even going far past the Old Testament into the world it was. And a scribe, of course, is a teacher, and, and, um, and that's as it should be, a, a disciple, the students that he was training to be able to share this word, this truth, with the world. Verse 53. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. He left. 54. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue. He didn't hide. It was right in their church downtown. Insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? How, how can he do this? He's healing people. He's casting out demons. He has authority. And, and after all, remember, he grew up here. 50, 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Question. And of course, it wasn't. It's the son of the living God. Is not his mother called Mary a good woman? You bet. And his brother... Uh, brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. We, I mean, he grew up right here. We know him. How, where did he get all this from? Verse 56, And his sisters, and are they not all with us? I mean, we've seen them every day. They're just like we are, common. Whence then hath this man all these things, all this wisdom, all this ability to cast out demons, to heal the sick, how can that possibly be? Verse 50, what, now what, what does that show lack of? Faith. And without faith, your works are dead. Okay. That is to say, you, you have no results. Verse 57, And they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country, and in his own house. In other words, um, a prophet is not going to be respected by those that, want, because they don't have any faith. Th this, word, um, this word offended is, uh, means to be, um, is stupent. It means to, a little bit on the sottish side. Okay? They're, they're offended and, and um, they're, they're in a stupor. As for, which means they don't have any faith. And without faith, again, I will say it, you, you might as well stop. God is not going to hear. Okay. Verse 58. And he did not many ma uh, mighty works there because of their unbelief. And there you have the answer. Where there is unbelief, God's not going to touch it. This is why a lot of people, when they pray, they kind of say, well... I know he's probably not going to hear me, but I'm going to pray anyway. You're wasting your time. You declared your unbelief before you even started. 
So you're not, you're wasting your time, but you're sure not going to waste God's time because he won't have anything to do with you. Unbelief is a terrible thing. It is, well, let's, let's say it like it is. It's an insult to the living God. It's an insult to the creator of all things. This beautiful, wonderful earth was created by him and you don't believe upon him. He that put the borders where the ocean can only go so far, whereby you have a safe um, habitation and, and you don't believe in him. When you look out at night and see the stars as they go from throughout the universe, he put all that in motion and, and you don't believe in him? Then you are in a heap of hurt. So that's why your prayers aren't answered. He's not gonna mess with you because it's an insult to have unbelief or to say, I don't know if he'll hear me or not. He'll hear you, but he will only answer if you love him and have faith to what is good for you. Why? Because he only wants good things for you. So uh, unbelief is a terrible thing, but what a beautiful set of uh, pro uh, parables to, to open your eyes and your ears whereby you can understand the rest of God's word. Why, how can you understand it? Well, he told you about the serpent seed there in verse 38 uh, and nine, whereby you become aware. And then when it's mentioned in the rest of the word, you can absorb it. And, and so it is with those parables. They're beautiful, they're wonderful, and um, it's a chapter that gives you strength and lets you know God wants you to believe. Chapter 14, 